What the world needs now, the song starts. What does the world need now? Ask anyone, anywhere, at any time, and the top three answers will be love, joy, and peace. And certainly God gives us those three things. Amazing love, peace that passes understanding, and joy unspeakable, full of glory. Those are the top three things that the Bible says are the fruits of the Holy Spirit. What the world needs now is love, sweet love, according to the song. But where do we get that love? Where do we get the joy that we want, the peace that we need from God? I would suggest that the answer should be what the world needs now is God. And not just any God. We need the God who needs nothing. Because a God in need is no God indeed. Certainly not the God that we need. You see, doctrine is in very important. And I want to talk for a moment about the importance of theology. When Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. It's important we know who the God we worship is, who the God who is, is. We can't know what or who we are until we know what and who he is. And so here in our pastor's study, brought to you from the pastor's study, we've been looking at the doctrine of God for the past two weeks. We saw that he is the creator, the source of everything. We talked about the existence of God two weeks ago. And then last week, he is Trinity, three persons in one. Today, I want to go on to the first doctrine beyond that of who God is, because we need to know who this God is before we can truly worship him, know who he is, so we can know who we are. You see, I want to talk about these attributes, not as things that describe him, but as attributes are really identifying him. The simplicity of God means that his attributes don't describe him like an adjective. He is fast. But they identify him. These are not adjectives, but predicate nominatives. God is not just loving. God is love. He's not just good. He is goodness. He is holiness. These attributes not just describe God, but they identify him. And so we want to look at this doctrine because this doctrine of simplicity or God's lack of need, a God who needs nothing is the God that we need. So the two doctrines that we will look at this time are actually, first we'll see his self-existence, and then we will see his self-sufficiency. These two are combined into a God who needs nothing. So the doctrine, the teaching about God, this attribute of God, the world needs a God who doesn't need anything. Hi, my name is Pastor Jeff Hartman, Pastor Stanford Baptist Church in Stanford, Connecticut, and this is our third study in the Doctrine of God from the Pastor's Study. So when God introduces himself, gives his name to Moses, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, Moses said, Who shall I say sent me? God said to Moses, Tell him, I am who I am sent you. You shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. His name, Jehovah Yahweh, is Hebrew, I am. And God says that identifies who I am. I am my attributes. It's not like Jeff is short or tall, Jeff is heavy or skinny. God is holy. God is holiness, not God is just loving, but God is love. And here he's talking about his existence. When he says, my name is, I am who I am, he's not just saying that's a name, like my name is Jeff, which doesn't represent anything, but this is who he is. And here he gives us at least four glimpses of what he is like and who he is. His simplicity. He is, there's nothing hidden behind who he is. Jeff doesn't tell you anything about who I am, but his identity is I am who I am. His uniqueness, he no one else is like him. Some people are like me, look like me, think like me. No one is like him. 
He's also talking about his eternality. He is the eternal present one because for him there is no time, no past, present, future. I am not who I was. I am who I am, present tense. And it brings us to our two doctrines today, his self-existence and his self-sufficiency. He's dependent on no one for his existence. He has no father or mother. He needs no one for his continued existence. These are the two doctrines we'll look at today. Maybe we could call that his independence. We are relatively independent if we pay our own bills, we take care of ourselves, but God is uniquely independent. He is self-existent and self-sufficient. So these are the doctrines that are revealed by his name, I am who I am. Let's look first of all at God's self-existence, his origin. Where did God come from? Every child knows that everything comes from something else. And so a child will ask, where did that come from? Because a child knows it's just something that we can assume, that everything comes from something else and something at least equal to, if not better, because something lesser can't make something better than it is. I can make a painting, but a painting can't make me. So a child knows and asks intuitively, where did I come from? I came from mommy's tummy. Well, where did mommy come from? She came from her mommy. We want to know, where did God come from? And that's a good question. There must be an uncaused cause, of course, although people won't admit that, atheists won't admit that, there is an uncaused cause. We have an uncaused cause. Our uncaused cause is God. If you are an atheist, then your uncaused cause is nothing or everything. But in the beginning, there had to be something or where did it all come from? Our uncaused cause is personal, not impersonal. And the truth is, a personal being can make personal beings like us and impersonal objects. But can the impersonal make personal beings? Where did it all come from? A child instinctively asks, where did God come from? We want to ask, where did God come from? And the answer is, God didn't come from anywhere. The Bible doesn't start with an argument for the existence of God, as we saw two weeks ago. It starts with the assumption that God was already there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Where was God before that? For God there was no before. Genesis 1.1 just tells us we're now in a new category. God is not like us. All of us have a source. All of us owe our existence to someone or something else. But God is unlike us. He is like us in that he's personal, but he's unlike us in that he is self-existent. Something has to be an uncaused cause. And for us, God is the one big miracle. For the atheist, everything is a miracle. Everything is God. Everything is the uncaused cause. When I was a new Christian and I was reading through the Bible for the first time, I came across a smart, smart aleck answer for where did God come from. Habakkuk 3.3 says, God came from Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Where did God come from? I could say God came from Teman. Where's Teman? It's in the Middle East somewhere. But that's not saying that that's where God came from. That's just a smart aleck answer. Actually, God came from nowhere. God has always been. Logically speaking, something must have always been there before there was a before. And for us, God reveals himself to be the one who was there. That's what the Bible teaches us, not just in Genesis 1.1. John chapter 1, verse 1, he starts just like Genesis, consciously. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There is the duality, trinity of God in the very beginning of John. He was in the beginning with God. Jesus was the second person in the trinity, like the first and the third, was there in the beginning when everything else began. All things were made through him. All of the stuff, animate, us, and inanimate, the earth we live on, and all of the universe, 
God made it. Without him, nothing was made that was made. It takes someone to make something. In him was life. It takes a living thing to make living things. And the life was the light of men. John 1.1 1, 1 tells us that God is self-existent. Colossians chapter 1, Paul says, verses 16 and 17, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, Everything in the universe, as our technology gets better, we discover how vast the universe is. We're just beginning to understand. But all of it has its source in God. Everything has a source in someone else, and that's God. Visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. God has self-existence and self-sufficiency. Everything else owes its existence and its ongoing existence to God. In Hebrews chapter 1, God has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Everything that we see is made, made by someone, made by God who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, yes, everything that we know, everything that we see, everything that we touch has all been made, but there has to be someone who was not made, someone who is self-existent, and that self-existent one is God. Psalm 90 verse 2 speaks eloquently, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Not you were God. God has always been God. God will always be God because God is the eternal one, one of our next studies. But God is as the eternal one self-existent, to be eternal in both directions, not only everlasting like we are, God is everlasting into the future, but eternal into the past, which we are not. In order for God to be eternal, he has to be, by definition, self-existent. So we see that very important word, you are. I am who I am. He is in the eternal present because he's not in time. And so he is God, and we don't say he was God, and he is God, and he will be God. He is God, period, unashamed. We say there is an eternal God who is self-existent. Without shame, we can say God is the uncaused cause. Our uncaused cause is personal and logical. The creator, God. The atheist's uncaused cause is everything from which the Big Bang came. So, we want to see first his self-existence, his origin. Next, we want to talk about his self-sufficiency, his existence. We like to say we are self-sufficient if we pay our own bills, dress ourselves, clean ourselves. But God is totally self-sufficient because he needs no one or nothing. There are three steps to theology, we can say. First, there is a God. Second, in humility, we have to say, that's not me. But the third step is, God doesn't even need me. If God is God indeed, then he's not a God in need, and he needs not me or anyone. God needs nothing. What does God need? All of us need, none of us are really self-sufficient. I need air. I need water. I need food. I need warmth. I need shelter. I need doctors. I need farmers. I need police officers. I need other people. We are in, interdependent on one another. But we are all dependent. None of us are truly self-sufficient. What does God need? According to Scripture, the God who is, I am who I am, is dependent on no one or nothing for his origin or for his continued existence. God is self-sufficient. We see that in John chapter 5, verse 26. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. I have life, but I received it as a gift from my father and my mother. And they likewise received it as a gift 
from their father and mother. But ultimately, Adam and Eve received it as a gift from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one who has life in himself. I have life as a gift, which my physical life can be lost. God's cannot be lost because he is self-existent and self-sufficient. And so he has life in himself, unlike any of us. We also see in Acts chapter 7, 17, verse 25, Paul described God. He is worshipped with men's hands, but as not as though as he needed anything. He doesn't ask for our worship because he needs our worship, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. He gives life. We don't. We pass it on to someone, but he has it in himself. But notice that phrase, as though he needed anything. There's our title. God needs nothing. Is God? Did God make us because he was lonely? No. That's what we saw last week, the Trinity. He doesn't need to make us because he's lonely. He doesn't need anyone. We are creatures. As creatures, we are defined by need. But God is God, and he has no needs. He is the creator, and he is the one who is self-sufficient, indeed has no needs. There are two different phrases that describe God, and here Paul is talking about the transcendent God who is over everything. Transcendent means he is above his universe. It's not pantheism, as if the universe is a part of God, or God is a part of the universe. He is over the universe. He's transcendent. But at the same time, it's not a deistic God who is distant and far and uncaring. He is in everything at the same time. So his transcendent says he's above us, but his imminent says he is among us, he is here in the universe that he created because he is a, a caring creator. And so Paul goes on from verse 25 to say, He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far above from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. Beautiful words. God is transcendent over us. He doesn't need anything, verse 25. But he wants us to love him. He loves us and he wants us to grope for him and to come to him and to repent. He doesn't need us. But we do live and move and have our being in him because he's not only transcendent. He is imminent. This is the God that we worship, the God who doesn't need anything, but he has a voluntary relation to all that he has created. Not that it is necessary. I need to have a father and mother to have existence, but God has no necessary relationship to his creation. He has a willing, voluntary relationship to us. He created us not because he needed us, but because he wanted to share his love with someone. So he has no necessity for anything other than himself, but he chooses to want us. He doesn't need us. So this is the beautiful doctrine of God's transcendence, God's self-existence, God's self-sufficiency, God's independence, total independence. But God forbid that we make doctrine boring. I believe, as a pastor, as a teacher, that making doctrine boring is a sin. This is an exciting doctrine. It's not just some cold clinical discussion of some God far away from us. All of our problems and their solutions are theological. That great quote comes from A.W. Tozer in his great book, Knowing God. You see, doctrine should issue forth in practice. The world needs a God who doesn't need anything. It's important for us to understand who God is because that's the God that we need. Isn't it great that the world needs a God who doesn't need anything and the world has a God who doesn't need anything and he doesn't need us, but he wants us to want him. And so we need him because all of our problems and their solutions are theological. We could just figure out who God is we'd understand where the solution is. So let's look at how 
God's independence, self-sufficiency, and self-existence relates to us. First of all, it relates to the nature of our sin. Every sin is really disrespect to God. God doesn't know. God doesn't care. And especially, it is an assertion of our own self-existence and our own self-sufficiency. I don't need God. Isaiah 14 tells us about the rebellion of Satan. You have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation of the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. What is Lucifer saying here? I don't need anyone. I don't need anything. I am my own God. And here is what our sin is. It is our declaration of independence from God. He is the one who doesn't need anything. We need him. But when we say, I can do it myself, like a child might say foolishly, we are asserting our own self-existence and self-sufficiency. When Adam and Eve sinned, Genesis chapter 3, the serpent said, you will not surely die. God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. What was the temptation? A tasty apple? No, it was independence from God, declaring their own self-existence and self-sufficiency. It was not just disobedience, don't do this, and they did it. It was an act of rebellion to God's authority in their life. And so, when we sin, we go our own way, as Isaiah says. Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, Christ, the iniquity of us all. Our sin is an assertion of our independence from God. It is a rebellion against his self-existence, his self-sufficiency. And we are saying, I am. I am all that. We are saying, I don't need you. God is willing to share himself, even sacrifice himself. But he can never be dethroned. There are many manifestations of his presence, but there is one essence of him, and it is, I am that I am. And when we sin, we rebel against that God. It also, we see 1 John 5, 12, affects the nature of our salvation. The God who needs nothing is the one who gives us what we need most, and that is salvation. In him is life. Remember we saw that? He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. In my Bible I have beside these words, K-I-S-S. -S. As a reminder to me, keep it simple, stupid. It's as easy as that. If you have the Son, you have life. If you don't have the Son, you don't have life. Because Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, if you don't have Christ, you don't have life, eternal life, because he is life. And notice those words couched in there, not hidden. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is there subtly or not so subtly claiming to be. The I am, the one who has life, because he doesn't just say, I have life. He says, I am life. I'm not a way, a truth, or a life. I am the life, because Jesus is the self-existent, self-sufficient God. He not only has life, he is the life. That's what salvation is, getting life because you get life, which is Jesus. It also affects the nature of our sanctification. Once we are a Christian, once we become a child of God, he begins a process of sanctifying us, making us more like him, making us more his. Sanctification is not only holiness, but it is set aside for a purpose, God's purpose. And so in Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And who is he? He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the self-existent, self-sufficient one. 
Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, Jesus is God, and whether we worship him or not, he is God. When we worship him, we don't elevate him any more than when we curse him, we dethrone him or bring him lower. We can't make him higher with our praise, and we can't make him lower with our cursing. He is who he is. He is life. He is truth. He is light. He is life. <clears throat> when we worship him, we are just admitting who he is. And so, even if we all closed our eyes, or even if we were all blind, the sun would still shine, right? Whether we worship him or not, he is who he is. Sanctification is just bowing our knee and admitting who he is. <clears throat> Fourth, this God who is a God who needs nothing also affects the nature of our sufficiency. Where do we get what we need? <clears throat> we are dependent on God. We're dependent on each other. But we're dependent on one who is not dependent on anyone or anything. James 1 tells us every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. We often blame God for our problems. Do we take as much time to thank him for his blessings? Everything that we have that is good comes from God. We are not dependent on some dream. We're not dependent on some stream that can be cut off. We are dependent on the one who is always there. And so in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, Paul says, who makes you to differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Everything that I have, my life, my talents, my abilities, my accomplishments, I have them all as a gift from God. He is reminding us to humble us. Everything we have is a gift. So then he says, now if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? God needs nothing. We can't pat ourselves on the back for the things that we've done because they all come as a gift. God gives us the life, the breath, the strength, the idea, the energy. God accomplishes it all. And so we never find a God who says, sorry, I'm all out. God is the endless stream, the self-sufficient one, the one who meets all of our needs, but indeed has no needs himself. And fifth, this doctrine of God's self-sufficiency affects us in the nature of our service. Why do we serve God? Because God needs our help. Sometimes we imagine that. Matthew 9, 37, he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So verse 38, Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to stand out laborers into his harvest. Does God need laborers? No, God doesn't need anything. But we're supposed to pray not for God to get help. We're so supposed to pray for God to send help because God is the source. He's always the source. And so we sometimes imagine that God needs missionaries. Does this mean we don't plead for people to become missionaries, to become Bible students, to become pastors, to go out into the fields here in our homeland? God needs no one. But he does stoop to work in and by and through us. And though he needs no one, he chooses to work through anyone. He doesn't need me to present this truth to you, but he deigns to use me. And that is our privilege. So never fall for the lie that God needs us. Never stoop to that idea. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 6, I planted, Apollos watered. Yes, God asks us to do things. But God gave the increase. God, who needs nothing, chooses to use us. And he who needs no one deigns to work through anyone who will cooperate with him in spreading the gospel to all the world. And so that great song of the faith, the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow, praise him all creatures here below, this is the God that the world needs. 
a God who needs nothing, but stoops to love us and to use us, to save us, to be not only over us, but in us. Let's pray. God, we thank you for who you are, the great God that this world needs. We thank you that you need nothing, but thank you that you supply our need through Christ Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week for our next study in the pastor's study.